So we're going to continue on with our discussion about how to design uh, steel beams for uh, you know, bending and shear. Um, and so in the previous uh, videos we had, we looked at um, sort of the bending uh, capacity for both the section and uh, sort of the uh, for a given segment length. Um, and in this video, we're going to look at shear. This video is really going to be a sort of an introduction and overview uh, and sort of lay out where we're going to uh, go over the next series of videos, which we'll break down into a little bit smaller chunks. So when we're looking at shear, you know, there's really two conditions um, that we were interested in when it comes to uh, shear and steel members. So the first one is um, looking at shear flow. Um, and so a shear flow, this would be like, uh, this is particularly uh, important if you have a built up section. So say that you have a section which is a, a, a T section or a box section, uh, which is a series of welded plates which are held together. So we need to look at the shear flow um, at that interface to uh, determine what the um, sort of what, what size weld that we need. Um, the other uh, point and probably uh, so the other uh, sort of condition which we consider for steel members is the one which we probably think of uh, probably even before the shear flow and that's just you know what's the maximum shear force that a section can carry. Um, and so our governing equation out of the steel standard is this where we have uh, V star which is our demand uh, it has to be less than or equal to our strength reduction factor phi uh, times our uh, shear strength uh, of that section and then I have a little note here uh, which is saying that you know typically um, shear only governs uh, the uh, design of a section if you have a really short and really really short span with a really really high load so for your typical beams um, of, of uh, you know particular of, of normal lengths and, and normal loadings um, oftentimes shear force is not going to be the governing mem uh, governing action uh, which is going to drive the design of that section and for this reason is why we always uh, will design a member uh, say if we have a beam uh, we will design that beam uh, for uh, bending uh, demands and then we will go through and we'll just check the shear so um, that, that's sort of the, you know, the two conditions uh, which we'd look at it. Uh, but before we go further, I thought it would be good if we just do a quick review of you know, what is shear, how does it manifest, and uh, you know, why do we see the particular uh, equations that we have. And so for just a quick recap on shear, um, the important thing to know with shear is that you know, by definition, shear is just the change of moment over... Uh, a small length over some length dx and uh, the reason this is important is that if we um, have a constant moment uh, across a section uh, then we have um, zero shear and so um, what I've drawn up here this is sort of like a, a little graphic derivation and really this is um, as a reminder so much of this should be familiar to you already but say we have some beam um, and it has uh, a point load here. And so and then I've drawn the um, moment distribution over the length. And say I look at some small section. So this is, say, infinitesimally small. I've drawn it at a finite length. But uh, we've got some length dx. And at one end of uh, that beam, it has the moment demand of uh, m. And then some a uh, little bit further way down, it has the moment demand of m plus dm. So some small uh, change in, in the moment here. So if we, um, if we look at what the uh, stress distribution is over um, this uh, you know, uh, section, well, it's going to have some bending stress. And if we assume that plane sections remain plane, we'll have a, a and that we haven't yielded yet, we will have a nice... Um, linear behavior in our uh, bending stress distribution, this sigma here, and uh, we will have some parabolic shape for our uh, shear stress distribution. Um, with our bending, our maximum stress is at the extreme fibers, and for our shear stress, it is at the neutral axis. And so, you know, why is the uh, at the neutral axis? Well, 
and I've shaded in this little portion Y here. So say we take a, you know, if we have this little piece that we've cut out, and this is the cross section. Say I take another free body diagram at some depth Y. And uh, if I draw this, and this is sort of uh, looking down, I was sort of looking uh, up uh, at the cut here. Well, because we have um, some, you know, distribution M on the side, this is kind of like we take uh, the um, free body diagram, uh, and so we take the stress distribution from just this portion up here. And on one side, you know, this will be, um, you know, triangular and then over the uh, width of the section, but it has some resultant force F. And then on the other side, well, because we've got M plus DM, it has some resultant force F plus some small little change uh, DF. Well, if we sum all of this up, well, this needs to be in equilibrium. Well, we, we have this discrepancy here. And so currently, if we don't have a force generating um, uh, at the cut, well, the little element will go this way. So that's how we get this... Um, you know, shear force here, which is df, and that's going to equal our uh, shear stress, tau, uh, times the width of the member, uh, times dx. And so this is, um, you know, that's how we, we get uh, shear in a, in a member. And so I've drawn a rectangular section, but this is true for I sections, for channels, etc., etc. This is really any time that we have a, a difference in bending stress across the length, we're going to generate a shear. Now, um, and, and that shear is going to be longitudinal. It's going to be down the length. So, you know, this, these little arrows here, this little shear stress uh, is going to be uh, manifesting itself down the length. Well, again, because everything needs to be in equilibrium, if we have this longitudinal shear at the corner, well, that's going to generate, that's, we need a, a transverse shear uh, both here and then over here, uh, and these are in the opposite directions. Um, and that's what we need in order to keep this element um, sort of stable. And so this is why we get transverse shear uh, for, um, you know, simply from longitudinal uh, behaviors. Now, um, this is where, you know, and it's this factor here, is what uh, brings up this shear flow. So, um, and, and, and this is where we will go in the next uh, few videos is one, we'll look at how we, uh, we take care of the shear flow. And then this maximum shear force, we'll find out it, it is uh, directly related to sort of our section geometries and what the uh, shear stress distribution is uh, along the height there. So um, in terms of when we're looking at, um, you know, designing for shear, I've got some, you know, four important things to note uh, when we're looking at shear. So uh, the first one is that shear is zero uh, at a free surface. So if we go back to our little free body diagram uh, here at the top, um, so this is a free surface, uh, we have shear is zero. Uh, that makes sense shearing. Uh, you need you know two elements rubbing across each other. So you can think of shear if you've got your hands here and you're moving them back and forth you're going to generate some friction. That friction is analogous to your shear, but you're only going to feel it on your palms. You don't feel anything on the back of your hands. So that's the free surface. And so, you know, that makes some intuitive sense. Um, the other one is that, uh, just like we said with our little free body diagram, um, our transverse shear is a result of our longitudinal shear. So this transverse shear, which is manifesting itself uh, here and here, is really a result from this longitudinal shear which is a result from this unbalanced uh, force, which is uh, you know due to this change in moment. And like I said before, uh, this is a a big deal when it comes to built-up sections and looking at you know what the particularly say the demand on a weld would be. Um, the other one is that shear stress is a maximum at the neutral axis, and uh, we use um, sort of uh, this factor as well as the um, shear stress distribution being a function of the geometry uh, really to dictate how we determine the shear capacity of a given section. So in terms of you know geometry here, uh, I've got a few sort of uh, drawn um, here. So you know there if we have a rectangular cross section and so you can see I've got a little red arrow 
of uh, which is denoting the um, you know which direction the load is being applied so for a rectangular cross section you can see we have this parabolic um, shear stress distribution um, for a T section uh, also parabolic but then we have the uh, the flanges are linear and so this is all and same uh, with all of uh, the other elements which have uh, portions of the section which are perpendicular to the applied load. Um, this is coming straight out of uh, shear flow um, and so we won't go over shear flow. I assume that you've already uh, been exposed to it previously um, and this is really just kind of to remind you uh, of some of these shear stress distributions. So but where this is um, important is when in design really what we want to do is first we want to determine whether you know, little portions are going of the of the webs are going to buckle before uh, we yield. Uh, but the next thing we really want to find out is, you know, what is the shear stress distribution on the webs of the elements which are um, oh, that are resisting that shear, and and whether we can approximate them as uniform or as non-uniform. If they're uniform, then we can approximate it uh, fairly simply, essentially taking a uh, an average shear stress across here. Um, if they're non-uniform, we need to have some factor uh, which um, sort of uh, accounts for that. Uh, one point, so a, a couple points of, of interest here. Um, you can see with the, the I section and the H section, uh, nominally the same section, just one has been rotated 90 degrees, and that rotation will really dictate uh, sort of what that shear stress distribution. So when uh, the force is parallel to the web. Um, because the, uh, the doubly symmetric uh, section of the flange is top and bottom, really for sort of force the um, shear stress distribution in that web to be more or less um, equal uh, from where it starts to its maximum at the neutral axis. Uh, if we turn that 90 degrees and we're, uh, say, pushing about the weak axis of this section, uh, and so turning it from sort of an I into an H, uh, what you find is that it's really acting kind of like two little separate rectangles, which are just connected, because the um, uh, so now the flanges are what are resisting that shear, and you'll see that you know this web because it's turned horizontal and it's right on the neutral axis, um, it actually ends up taking uh, zero shear stress. Uh, the other interesting one is a circular hollow section. So if you are bending a uh, a pipe. Um, it is a, you know, it's got kind of this funny, um, almost bat-winged uh, style, um, uh, you know, shear stress distribution. So, um, we, you know, we, we approximate this as uniform, and really what the uh, standard does is it forces you to cut off um, the, uh, you know, sort of the amount which of the section which you can rely on to something of kind of these, uh, you know, just these quarter points here. Um, which approximate the web. So um, when we are, um, you know, as I've alluded to previously, uh, when we're looking for uh, shear stress, uh, what we'll do is we'll look for the following. Um, let's move this over here. Um, first, uh, you know, if we have a built-up section, we need to see, make sure that the, uh, the welds are gonna hold. And we do that from longitudinal shear flow. And that's our equation for longitudinal shear flow, just uh, small q equals the applied shear uh, times first moment area of the uh, portion above um, the, uh, the location of interest uh, divided by the uh, moment of inertia. And then um, if we're just simply looking at the capacity of a section, the first thing we want to do is determine if the portions which are uh, resisting that shear, um, we need to check their slenderness and see if they will buckle um, before they reach plasticity um, or, or if they will reach the full plastic section. If they reach the full plastic section, we, we call them a stocky web. Uh, if they don't, that's a slender web. And then based upon uh, essentially which category these are, uh, we look and see when, what the shear stress distribution is, whether it's uniform or non-uniform. Uh, and then we, uh, we choose the appropriate equation for each. And all of those equations are essentially some modification of um, you know, our ideal case where we have a uh, uniform distribution and a stocky section. So 
Um, that is the uh, you know sort of our overview for uh, how we design for shear stress. Um, and uh, we'll have a, a series of videos uh, which will um, one either be example videos looking at this or um, we'll walk through some of these code equations um, in, in a bit more detail. So uh, thank you for watching.